Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you all. I see some of you every week and some of you I don't see every week. And whether I see you every week or not, it is great to see you right now. I have several announcements, but I don't want to read the whole things. So I'll kind of just give you teasers for the announcements. First of all, this Wednesday at noon and ending promptly at 1 so those who so desire can get back to work, we will have our bag lunch Bible study. And we will be looking at Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the great worship of heaven in which we shall someday participate. We have a good mission project going on. Connie has told us a little bit about it. We are collecting blankets that will go to help local people stay warm on these brisk days and the colder days to come. We will be handing out Halloween candy, so please consider grabbing a bag of Halloween candy when you're in the store and just bring it and drop it by the church and we will take care of distributing it to the children for you. Love in the Name of Christ is doing a interesting fundraiser that might be of real benefit to you. For $5, you can buy a coupon for Boss Cops that will give you 25% off of everything that you buy on a particular day. So if you buy a lot, that $5 given to Love, Inc., will be a big savings. And there's two ladies' conferences going on, and the details are in the bulletin. Are there any other, other, another, are there any other announcements anyone would like to share? All right. Good morning. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Loving God, our refuge and our strength, grant us grace this day to perceive your loving presence. Help us to discern your purposes for our lives and empower us to live new and better lives in and for Jesus. Free us from sin and selfishness. Free us for joyful obedience and for faithful following our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.
Today, both our call to confession and our assurance of pardon come to us from God through the prophet Isaiah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Trusting in God's saving work, let us confess our sin together. Almighty Father, you have raised Jesus from the dead and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we do not always fully surrender to the loving Lordship of Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, you have united us with Jesus and with one another. We confess that our words and acts sometimes contribute to disunity, and in so doing, we injure the worship, work, and witness of the church. You have made us the body of Christ on earth. Please help us to increasingly live out the love, unity, power, joy, and mission that come with our glorious identity in Christ. In his name we ask these things. Amen. Through Isaiah, God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. In Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Do you ever just want your busy life, just your busy life to kind of slow down? And just because you're retired or in a golden year of your life does not mean that it's not busy. On the contrary, I would say. But do you want it to slow down just a little bit? and maybe not have as many big adventures. But, so there is this small but very good saying, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know who I am and what I am. Be still and know that I love you. Be still and just be. Do we ever think 
about that. We just want to be present with the Lord. We are right now. The Christian faith is about trusting in Jesus and living with our Creator. Isn't that what it's about? The more we can live in the present moment, the more we can encounter God. So adults and kids out there that might be sleepy-eyed, let us know that God is with us. And we can encounter God, learn from our past, but not to dwell on it. Be very present with Jesus and with our Creator. And let's pray. Dear God, however you find us today, help us to be focused on your loving presence and that we will be still and know that you are our God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Don't worry, I'm not your special music. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, our God, your, your word is a lamp, lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love so that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have the first scripture reading, and it's I'm taking the last verse of 16, John 16, the 33rd verse, and then I'm going to go to chapter 17 and start with verse 19 and read. So if you're following along, you'll be able to keep up or track me. I'm starting with John 16, 33. And I'm reading through 219. Okay, my mistake. But um, so we'll go right from the last verse of 16. First verse of 17. John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And then chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. And you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty 
that I came from you and they believe that you sent me, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As they sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And then the second reading continues. There we go. Picking up with 1720, Jesus continues, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make them known in order that the love you have given me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. God's word for us, God's children. It's tough to preach on a prayer. This journey through John has caused me to work with and speak from several passages that people often skip over. And that's probably a good thing. Because the Bible is not a smorgasbord from which we go and pick what we like. It is the well-rounded food of our souls given by God. Before we get into what I hear God laying on my heart and hopefully yours from this passage, 
It seems necessary to briefly clarify two concepts. First is the use of the word name. In verses 11 and 12, Jesus says, Holy Father, protect them. And the NIV says, by the power of, but that's an NIV is, and those words aren't really there. It says, Holy Father, keep them in my name. That's what it really says. Holy Father, keep them in my name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them safe by the name that you gave me. In the Bible, the word name often, I would even say usually, refers to the character of a person, the nature of a person. And so when Jesus says that he has kept us in his name, and now because he's leaving, he asks the Father to keep us in his name, I think Jesus is simply asking God the Father to keep the disciples faithful to the teaching and the character of Jesus. And if we are faithful to the teaching of Jesus, then our character will become more and more like his character, and we will enjoy the unity into which he calls us. The second point of clarification concerns the use of the word sanctify and sanctify. In modern English, we tend to think of sanctify as be made holy. And that's its second definition. That's a derivative definition. To be made holy is simply to be set apart. My reading glasses are now holy. They are set apart from everything else. That is the root of the verb agiazo, sanctify, make holy. When Jesus speaks, of, when he says, let's do 17 and 19, Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And then in 19, he says, for them, I sanctify myself so that they may be truly sanctified. In those verses, sanctify and sanctified mean set apart, consecrated, set apart from the world and set apart for God and for God's work. When Jesus speaks about sanctifying himself, he's talking about setting himself apart as a sacrifice. The sacrifice he would give on the very next day when he died on the cross in order to accomplish the salvation of all who trust in him. Now for the sermon. We know that in the Gospels, we see Jesus praying for long periods of time, sometimes several hours. Sometimes we even see Jesus pray all night. And yet, this prayer recorded in John chapter 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Several times in, John, in the John 17 prayer, Jesus uses odd verb tenses, like speaking of future events as if they were already present or even past. And that's one of the ways that Scripture expresses the certainty that God's plans will be accomplished. God has plans that are so certain that they can be spoken of as if they were already a fact. On that particular night, the night of his betrayal, Jesus chose to pray out loud in front of his disciples so that they could hear what he prayed. 
Have any of you ever had someone pray out loud for you and been deeply touched by the experience? I know some of you have because I've been in those prayer groups, some of them. It is a deeply humbling and yet empowering experience to have someone pray out loud for us. When we pray out loud for someone, it can be a great gift to them. And I know, I know, most of us are Presbyterians and we might think, oh, I I can't pray out loud. I don't know all those fancy words. I'm short on THs. You know, doth give us, us thine own blah, 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 blah. If you pray that way, if you pray like you're 500 years old and from Great Britain, more power to you. That's okay. The important thing is that we pray. But when we pray to God in normal everyday language, we demonstrate an appropriate, authentic relationship with God our Father. We can and should relate to God like children because that's what we are. We are children of God, and we do not need fancy words to talk to God. When we pray out loud for people, and yes, I'm begging you to do this. When we pray out loud for other people, it demonstrates our faith. It shows our concern. And when God does the things we ask out loud in front of them, those people take notice. It increases their faith and it glorifies God. Many a non-believer has come to faith through seeing prayers prayed in their presence come to fruition. In fact, that's a simple kind of evangelism that we can do. Do any of you know Jack Hayford or know of Jack Hayford? In the late 60s, he started a church in his living room. When I met him back in the 1990s at a conference, his church had 15,000 people in it. And he told us that the single most important principle, single most important practice that he did for church growth was to encourage his people to pray out loud for other people. And that sounds amazingly simple, but it's very effective. Try this. Don't try it once. Try it over and over and over again, and we'll be surprised what God makes happen. When we're out in public, and a friend or even a stranger tells us their problems... Do you ever have strangers come up and just start talking to you about their problems? It happens. It happens to me all the time. And when someone, friend or stranger, shares a problem with us, let's say, can I pray for you? And then if they say yes, then... Ask if we can touch them. If not, or if you don't want to, just say, well, let's just start praying right then and there. Pray for them right there. It's one thing to say, oh, I'll pray for you and walk away. That's what we usually do, isn't it? Try saying, can I pray for you? Sure. Let's do it. And pray right then and there. When they experience you praying for them and they experience God responding to your prayer, they're going to want to know more about where you go to church. Now it looks like 
here in John 17, that Jesus was praying only for the first 11 disciples. Remember, Judas has already left in chapter 13. It looks like Jesus is praying only for the 11 first disciples until we come to verse 20 where we are explicitly included in verses 20 through 26. I would say that at the very least, even though we're not explicitly included till verse 20, I am completely confident that all of the petitions that Jesus made for the original 11, Jesus has at some point also made for me and for you. And here's why. We can be confident that Jesus has prayed for us all the things that he prayed for the original 11 in John 17. We can be confident that Jesus prayed those things for us because as he did for those 11, he has now called you and me to participate with him in his ongoing ministry. And if we're going to participate with the Lord in what he's doing in the world today, then we need each of the blessings that Jesus mentions and prays for in John 17. Some people, when they read John 17, are bothered by the fact that Jesus explicitly says that he is not praying for the world. We see that in 17.9, where Jesus says, I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. Some people are bothered by that. If you're bothered by the fact that Jesus says he's not praying for the world, then remember John 3, 16. You know that verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son in order that those who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God does love the world. God the Father loves the world. He sent the Son. God the Son loves the world. He decided to come. And God the Holy Spirit loves the world because he lives with us right now. But in the Bible, the world often refers to people and systems that are in active rebellion against God. The world often refers to people and systems in rebellion against God. In this prayer, Jesus explicitly says he's not praying for the world directly, but by praying what he prayed for his disciples, Jesus did address the deepest needs of the world. He prayed that his followers, including you and me, would be empowered to effectively share his truth and his love with the world. And that, sharing the truth and love of Jesus, meets the deepest needs of the world. When you read or when you heard this prayer of Jesus in John 17, did something, did a concept leap out at you? perhaps from repetition? Well, when I read it, the concept of unity or oneness leaps out at me. Jesus explicitly mentions unity or oneness seven times, and he prays for it four times. Obviously, our unity is important to Jesus. And we're not going to get into this, but it was also very important to Paul. This unity for which Jesus prays, some people, in fact, I've heard people say, well, the prayer that Jesus prayed for unity didn't get answered because we got all these denominations. 
please believe me when I say that the unity for which Jesus prayed is not diminished by denominations. The unity for which Jesus prayed has nothing to do with institutions or organizations. The unity for which Jesus prayed is a spiritual unity, a unity that we have in Christ and only in Christ. It's kind of, kind of like the spokes on a wheel. The spokes on a wheel don't directly touch, and yet they are connected to one another because they're all connected to the center hub. Jesus is a center hub, and everyone who is connected to him, like branches on a vine, is organically, spiritually connected to everyone else who's connected to Jesus. The unity that Jesus prayed for and that we do have is a spiritual unity made possible by the indwelling Holy Spirit who gives us new birth and connects us to Christ. It is a unity of love, love for the triune God and love for one another. It's a unity of people who know that we belong to Jesus. And this unity includes a shared commitment to Jesus, to his teaching, and to participate with him in his ongoing ministry. Christian unity is not uniformity or sameness. Have you ever noticed how much God likes diversity? Look at creation. If you haven't already done so, you soon will be working on the leaves in your yard. I thank God for leaves when they're not beautiful and on the trees, and less so when I'm raking them. But just leaves are a great example of the diversity, the diversity that God has created. And of course, we see diversity everywhere. And God is still creating diversity. He's creating diversity by giving the manifold gifts of the Spirit to his people. The gifts of the Spirit, it's not one gift, it's multiple gifts. God makes us different. God makes us interdependent so that we need each other and so that we express some of the richness that is God. The unity for which Jesus prayed transcends denominations. And yet we can and should, regardless of what denomination we happen to be a part of, we can and should work together across denominational lines. We can and should work with Christians from other groups because we can accomplish more together than we can alone. And we should work with Christians from other denominations because when we come together, we provide a powerful witness to the world that the gospel is true. Please listen again to verses 17, 22, and 23. Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Finally, I've been looking for my phone for like the last 10 minutes, checking my pockets and stuff, because the clock doesn't work. And I don't want, I have to sort of, tweak the timing of this message because there's no special music. Yes, I don't want to let you go out early. No, it's not that. We have an hour to fill on TV. If we don't fill that hour, poor Luke has to do work extra special hard to find stuff to fill the hour that we have. So I just want to, you know, we could talk about John 17 for hours. But we're not going to do that. We're only going to do it until we're going to try and make everything work perfectly. 
So what is this glory that Jesus promises to us? Please ponder it with me. In John 17, the word glory occurs several times, and it's clear that Jesus speaks about different kinds of glory. He says in verse 1, Father, glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. That's clearly talking about the crucifixion. Because in the crucifixion, by the crucifixion, God is glorified because there on the cross, Jesus demonstrates the love of God. There on the cross, God the Father and God the Son say to each of us, I love you this much. The cross glorifies God by demonstrating God's love. The cross also glorifies God by accomplishing God's plan for the salvation of all who trust in Jesus. But that's not the glory he shares with us here. We don't get that crucifixion glory. In verse 5, Jesus asks, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before the world began. That's probably not the glory that we're given either. So what is this glory that Jesus gives to us so that we may be one? Well, based on the content of the prayer. There are three possibilities for this glory Jesus has given to us. The glory, number, number one, the glory that Jesus gave to us could be his teaching, his revelation of God. Now, the teaching of Jesus does unite us, especially when we actually live by it. The second could be the mission that Jesus has given us. The mission of speaking his truth, sharing his love, and leading lost people to salvation. Working together with other Christians does promote unity. And number three, the glory that Jesus gives to us that promotes unity could be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit certainly does unite us to Christ and with one another. Now, we will not know whether it's A, B, or C until we see Jesus face to face and get to ask him in person. But what do you think? Do you think that the glory is his teaching our participation in his ministry or the Holy Spirit? That's a trick question. I'm sorry. It's D. Tom's right. It's all of the above. Amen. So, 1723. We learn that unity, we, or we learn one of the reasons why unity is so important. Our unity convinces the world that Jesus was sent by God the Father. Our unity is so important because our unity is essential to evangelism and a lack of visible unity. When we gripe or complain about one another, when we talk about those other Christians, or even worse, when we gripe amongst ourselves, we are injuring the cause of Christ. Because the cause of Christ and its success is directly related to our unity. Our unity is given by God, produced by the Holy Spirit. But like most gifts, the gift needs maintained. If someone gave you a car, you'd have to maintain it. Putting gas in it, checking the tire pressure, having the oil changed, changing all those filters getting your annual inspection. Gifts require maintenance. And this, that is also true for our gift of unity and even our gift of salvation. 
Ephesians 4, 3, Paul says, make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. How do we maintain? How do we maintain the unity of the spirit? Well, here's a few ways. We maintain the unity of the spirit by living according to the teachings of Jesus, the center of which is self-giving love. We maintain the unity of the spirit by teaming up with other Christians to work together on the projects to which Jesus leads us. We maintain the unity of the spirit by refusing to gossip. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands for anyone who's ever gossiped. But if you do a little search in your Bible, maybe in the back, maybe get a real concordance, or maybe type it into your computer, you'll realize that gossip is a serious sin that God says a lot about. Gossip is serious. We maintain the unity of the spirit by refusing to, to gossip, refusing to nitpick. We maintain the unity of the spirit by refusing to speak any words which tear anyone down and committing ourselves to speaking only words which build others up. We maintain the unity of the spirit by being unselfish by not insisting on our own way. We maintain the unity of the spirit by forgiving others as God has forgiven us. Simply put, we maintain the unity of the spirit by doing our prayerful best to be and live as the new people that God has made us in Christ. I've talked about this not too long ago, but it's good and bears repeating. I think this is something that we need to hear often. Once upon a time, there was a woman who was trying to sell a weight loss product. Now the packaging was attractive. Her sales pitch was good and yet she was not moving much product. So she asked her husband if he had any idea why she was having difficulty selling this weight loss product. And her husband, having been married for a few years and being wise, said, do you want me to tell you the truth or to be polite? And she said, oh, tell me the truth. And he said, well, honey, on that nice packaging, there are before pictures and after pictures. And you, my beloved wife, look more like the before pictures. When the man woke up, <laughs> that story really, really shows how much we can help or hurt the cause of Christ. Because you see, Jesus changes people. He makes us better. If Jesus has not made you better than you were before, then there's something wrong with your relationship with Jesus and you should talk with him about it. When people look at you, do they see the before picture? The BC, the BC picture? the before Christ picture, or do they see the new you who is created to be like God? Has Jesus made a difference in your values and your priorities? Has Jesus made a difference in the way you spend your time and your money? Has Jesus made a difference in the way you treat strangers? Has Jesus made a difference in the way you treat your friends and family. When we live as the new people 
that Jesus helps us to be, then we facilitate the unity for which he prayed. Let's make a habit of praying for people out loud right in front of them. Let's make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And let's prayerfully strive to live in such a way that people see Jesus in us. Lord, make it so. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Serve on the church's session and have called First Church my home for more than 40 years. During these stressful times, we want you to know that we are praying for you. Even as our sanctuary doors have reopened, I continue to be thankful for modern technology which allows us all to meet in spirit. Recently, I felt drawn to Matthew 25, 40, in which the scripture points out that when we do something for the least of God's creation, we are doing it for Christ himself. I would like to extend to you a call to give, whether by your actions or monetarily. You may contribute to the ministries here at First Presbyterian by dropping an envelope in the collection box on your way into or out of the sanctuary, by dropping a check in the mail, or by visiting our website titusvillepresbyterian.com Thank you for your continued generosity. I pray you will find your hearts refreshed and your burdens just a little lighter. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Loving, Loving Father, may the gifts we offer bring food to the hungry, healing to the broken, community to the lonely, hope to the discouraged, and the light of Jesus to those who dwell in darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Chin, you only have to fill one minute. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace today and forever. Amen.